everyone, I'm Rebecca and welcome back to my channel. Since it is now finally fall here in the Pacific Northwest, I have been waiting to share this bodice with you until I could share it with you in the fall. It is one that I purchased honestly probably about a year, maybe even a little more than a year ago, but it is just like such the perfect fall autumnal bodice that, yeah, I mean, I would wear this thing if I had this in my size. I just think it is so gorgeous. So this bodice dates to the very, very late 1890s, probably about 1898 or 1899. We can tell that by things like the smaller puffed sleeves that are more vertical as opposed to horizontal, and also by the really, really tall collar, and the fact that we are just starting to get kind of a puffy look right here in the bodice. We still have our nice little nipped in waist. So this is just, I mean, again, so gorgeous. This is made out of brown silk with a cut silk velvet as its contrast. And I am so, so excited to show this to you. So let's go ahead and get a nice close up look and I will show you all about how this bodice is made. So I was really hoping that this one might actually fit on the dress form, but as you can see, it does not. Surprisingly enough, it does nearly fit at the hips, but this was clearly an outfit for a very small busted woman because it does not at all fit on the bust. And although it might look like it is coming close to fitting, it's actually not at all because the center closure is all the way over here. So this part right here, this is where the hooks are. This is where the eyes are. These are supposed to come together. And then this actually laps over the front to hide the actual closure. And something that I find really very interesting about this is that normally you will see a separate set of closures along this edge. Usually you'll have like hooks on this piece and then hidden underneath a flap over here, you'll see either regular like metal bars or metal hooks, or you'll see thread bars. This has none. So actually the only closures that we have are the ones here in the center. And then this just tucks in. So it tucks in like a little envelope right in there. And then I guess was expected to just stay because there's also just no sign of any closures that maybe were once there. Nothing. I did, however, notice this tack right here, which I at first didn't notice from the outside. Don't know how I didn't notice because it's actually super obvious. But there is a random thread bar right here. Let's get up close so you can hopefully see the details on that. You can see just how many stitches went into that thread bar. It's really quite amazing. And it's a huge thread bar. I mean, it's like as large as my thumbnail. I have no idea what might have hooked onto that. It's nothing to do with the closures. So it was probably some sort of decoration. Maybe she had like a rosette or an ascot or something like that that somehow hooked right there because this really would be like the center of this bodice. So I find that very, very fascinating. And we'll see if I find other hidden gems as I go along. There is one other thread bar, which is up here, but this actually goes along with this regular metal hook from the center up here. So although these eyes are here on the edge, there is no eye right here. And then there is the thread bar right up there, all of which correspond to the hooks that are at the edge over here, even though there's nothing for this one to actually go into. So this just kind of floats by itself. And then this one goes in into the eye. This one goes into the thread bar. So obviously there was maybe a little bit like of an overlap that needed to happen there. I mean, that's what I usually find with my bodices that I want that overlap because I have too much excess fabric here above the bust. So yeah, I did find that interesting. There is also, and I'll show you this more when we look at the inside of the bodice too, but there is kind of a waist stay section here. It's chonky. I mean, this is like four inches wide, at least maybe four and a half, but it's an additional piece of fabric. And this acts as a separate stay here that kind of stabilizes the bodice, puts less strain on the hooks and eyes that are on the silk because this is just on cotton. So we have this hiding over here on both sides. Again, I will show you more once we take the bodice off of the dress form, but it is in there. And it's really a gorgeous bodice when we come to the details. Like I absolutely love this pleated detail here going to the hip. I think that it's just gorgeous and so, so flattering. 
I also obviously love the use of this cut velvet. I think it is gorgeous. I mean, it's got the silk satin underneath with the velvet on top. And normally I'm not a fan of like brown bodices, but I think the shades used in here are really just lovely because we have this sort of reddish brown. It definitely reads a little more red in person than I think I'm getting on the camera. And then we have this really, really deep chocolate brown here over this almost like green khaki silk which is you know not a color you would expect to see in silk but I do think that's gorgeous and I love the way that it's been applied in points on the collar and on the wrists I think that was just a really gorgeous use of that special fabric the collar, by the way, does lap around. So as was so common with collars of this era, you don't see like a gap right here in the center for a closure. They usually come around and either will hook on the side or in this case, we're hooking right in the center back up there. And again, we have that pleated detail at the waist kind of in a way echoed here as well because we have the one pleat that runs all the way out here and then just the little pleat here, which is where the velvet centerpiece tucks underneath. We also have some lovely gathering goodness into the arm's eye because of course this is the 1890s we have to have a puff sleeve now this is most likely very late 1890s so our puff is much much smaller than you would see in the middle of the decade i mean really like it doesn't even stick out i'm pulling this right now gently of course because this is an antique but i am pulling this and it doesn't stick out any more than like this bicep part of the arm but you do see the fullness pleated in there it does stick up a little bit here above the shoulder so this to me tells me that it's like 1898 99 somewhere right in there this is a two-piece sleeve by the way and you can see that this bodice was worn quite a lot because she has some major pit stains and also just the silk in general is a lot more worn in the armpit than really anywhere else in this whole garment because of course armpits get a lot of wear you get a lot of movement you get the sweat so yeah this is some uh, lovely 124 ish year old sweat here in this bodice but as I mentioned we have this two-piece sleeve and I do find this really interesting this was very common in the 1890s especially where you actually get the outer piece of the sleeve which is wide it goes all the way around and then over here to the back and then we have a very narrow strip right here underneath but this outer piece actually winds up getting gathered in at the elbow so it's a very interesting sleeve shape like pattern shape and then we get that extra fullness at the elbow which also kind of helps to give that like bend of the arm that you see so pronounced there but also the fullness allows for more movement in the elbow and I love over here at the very back take a look at this all these lovely pleats come in and then join together in this gorgeous rosette i mean look at that this is literally just a spiraled strip so it has been gathered up i think this is kind of like how you do yo-yos but i'm not positive but it's a strip that's just been gathered up and it goes around and around and around and gets wider and wider and then this is just tacked in place both underneath right here and then you can actually see the tacking stitches right here i'm honestly surprised how obvious the thread is and this thread may have been a later edition or it's possible that the thread faded at a different pace than like the rest of the bodice because yeah we've got that gold thread with the brown bodice here or maybe it was a quick repair that was kind of like never meant to really be worn that way but yeah i just love the pleats coming into that very, very full rosette. I would imagine that the skirt was also very full, like a fantail type skirt in the back. So we'd really get the rosette and then we'd get the pleats coming out of the fullness of that skirt and it would just be so gorgeous. One thing that I do want to point out is that I feel like on a lot of patterns that we use nowadays, we get into the habit of, oh, this seam has to match this seam in the back. As you can see, that was not the case here. It's off by about half an inch. And actually, there's a lot of seams to this bodice. So we have here the front piece, which is, you know, pleated and very very intricate and then we have the side back second side back and finally the center back and there is that center back seam which is so wonderful you can tell actually that it curves in at the upper back that's something I find myself having to adjust a lot I tend to prefer a center back seam for that reason so it's nice seeing it here 
You can also see the binding at the neckline. This is just bias binding underneath where the collar meets. And then the collar has those hooks and there are thread bars right here, right on the edge of the back of the collar where they come together. While I was looking at the back here, I actually noticed one other thread bar. So we have another very nicely done thread bar right there. You can see all the detail. Again, I'm not positive what that was for, if maybe something hooked onto there because we already do have a very lovely sleeve. So it would be interesting to see what, if anything, did hook onto there. It is also interesting to note that it's right at the top of this opening V. So this little V allows the wrist to get nice and close together, like smaller than the hand and then allows the hand to pass through but would presumably then kind of close itself without the need for any additional closure once it's down at the wrist. So it is also possible that in this case this little thread bar actually kind of helps as like a stabilization to make sure that we never wind up splitting up that seam past where the thread bar is. Looking at the inside of the sleeve, if it will be bright enough in here, we have a really, really deep facing that runs the entire sort of length or width here of the cuff. So it's probably two and a half to three inch wide facing, and that is all hand stitched down here with tiny little whip stitches and again up here at the top with additional whip stitches and that facing is the same silk as the outer here but it actually seems far far dirtier maybe just from you know hands passing through and they were paying attention possibly to spots on the outside but not on the inside it's possible and when we really turn out that facing a bit you can see where it covers up the seam allowance right here so that we don't have any seam allowance like exposed at the bottom of the sleeve because we don't start to get loose seam allowance until above the facing which has been whip stitched on the outside so ideally won't fray but this way it doesn't even get in the way at all down here at the bottom. By the way all of the little points were tacked up after the facing was put in so you can see like that's a tacking stitch that's a tacking stitch. So that is what is keeping all of the points here in place. And similarly up here at the collar, they are also tacked down, but actually they're tacked down in a lot more places. The ones on the sleeve are only tacked here at the point. The collar ones are actually tacked all the way. And we can see those stitches on the inside here. You can see that like V of just loose hand stitches tacking down all of those little points on the collar. You can also see here the shaping that's going into this collar. I mean, it is not a straight piece. It is very curved and we've got pieces here to allow for all of those curves. This portion right here, the silk where it goes over the cut velvet is also all tacked in place, by the way. And now with that, let's go ahead, take her off the form, open her up and take a look inside. So here she is laying out flat. Now there are really a whole lot of treats when it comes to the inside of this bodice. So we're gonna start by untucking the cut velvet to reveal a hidden breast pocket. Look at that, it is just whip stitched around the edges and then the top right here has also been whip stitched down so it doesn't catch and it's a tiny little pocket. This could have been a watch pocket maybe or just a kind of secret place maybe to put coin or valuable and it's very small but very useful to have that little pocket hidden right in there and considering we have all of this real estate where it opens up here, it's no wonder that they would hide a pocket in there. It just makes a lot of sense. The other thing that you can see in here that I think is quite interesting is that the silk has actually been pieced quite a bit. So this right here, you can see the very top, the whip stitches right here. This section was actually pieced in. Part of it is coming out now. You can see where that seam is fraying. But yeah, we have just little piece section right here. And there is a little dart right here in that piece too. We have that on both sides. So for some reason, we just have that little pieced section in there. It is not an additional pocket, just some piecing. We can also tell that this section right here, so this is an additional sort of pleat gather. This one has actually been tacked in place so that it doesn't go anywhere. You can also really see the mixture of hand and machine stitching, like we have the hand stitching there, but then we have machine stitching here along this edge by machine, and we have that on both edges. So now one of the other things I love about this are the beautiful bindings 
on the seam allowance in this gorgeous lavender color. What a surprise from this brown bodice to get this gorgeous lavender binding in here. I really think it's fantastic. We can also see right away that this sort of pleated detail that I love so much on the bodice, it is actually a separate piece. So it is put on like a permanent belt and tacked all along the bottom edges here so that it won't, you know, fall off or lose its place. And it's got a nice deep hem throughout most of it with a narrow hem here where it comes into the point. And separately, we have a piece of binding that is finishing off the bottom of the bodice. This is bias binding. Now that said, the belt is actually also made on the bias. So you can see, hopefully, that the green lines, they're running in opposite direction from the bias binding to the belt, but they are both on the bias. We also get a better view of this really, really wide waist stay in here, which had originally five hooks that closed it. Now it's got four, it's missing one. And here is the same on the opposite side. This one has the eyes right there in the edge, which I find a very interesting technique to have them just kind of sitting in that edge with a machine stitch, making sort of an envelope for them to sit within. This is all machine made boning casing. And then it has been, I think that's a herringbone stitch with embroidery floss in place. It's a very thick, like a twisted floss. So again, we have like gorgeous yellow detail on top of this kind of golden color boning casing and then the beautiful lavender. And all of these have been stitched by hand, you can see the running stitches going through the binding here on the edge. So a few other things to note, you might notice that the seam allowances are actually really all across the board. Like we have a very, very large seam allowance right here. And this one is much narrower than that one. This one here in the back, I think is probably the narrowest of all. And again, we have another wide one here. So clearly they were doing some fitting after the mock-up stage, which is obviously totally fine. So this is all lined with a polished cotton here. This is flat lining, which is typical of most Victorian bodices. We do have a tiny bit of the baleen poking out right here in the boning channel. So you can see that this is baleen boning in here. That's what that black color is. That'll be baleen. A lot of the bones are missing from their channels. Like there's no bone in here, in here, in here. There's no bone and none in here. Another thing that I find interesting is that we actually have two different levels of padding here. So it kind of brought my attention because you can see some quilting stitches just kind of in the middle here. And so you can tell that there is some padding in here. However, the padding here is way, way thinner than the padding up here, which is super, super thick. It's at least twice as thick as this section here. And some of this padding is actually exposed over here in the flap. So I don't think that was ever covered by anything other than the fact that, you know, that flaps down like that. But yes, this is some sort of cotton or wool batting, kind of like modern day quilt batting that was just applied in there. And that section was also quilted through with those little tack stitches. In fact, we actually see more of those tack stitches back here. So it's very, very common for there to be padding in the front of a bodice. It's pretty rare, I would say, to see padding in the back. I don't have any other bodices in my collection that have it, but you can see this area right here just leading to the arm's eye is in fact padded. You can feel it, it's more on par with like this thickness than this thickness right here, but it goes to about here and just goes all the way to the arm's eye over here. Another element that I find quite interesting is that we have two different bodice hangers in this bodice. So this one has actually been made out of the tape that has been used for the binding, which by the way, the arm's eye is also bound with that tape. We just have a little bit here and it's tied in a knot. However, over here, there is a ribbon that is being used as a hanging tape. The lining of the sleeve, by the way, is a different cotton than the lining of the bodice. It's a slightly looser weave and it is a darker color as well. That's not just shadow that you're seeing. 
The last thing that I find pretty interesting is that some of these bones actually did apparently poke out at one point. And in fact, it seems to be bones that are currently missing because we have identical patches on the top of this bone, this bone, and this bone, all three of which are missing. These have just been tacked in place. They're actually made out of like a China silk. So it's no wonder that they didn't really work because obviously that is a very thin and fine silk. But since there are three of them, it's probably pretty safe to assume that these were done by the original owner, especially because it's made out of a nice silk. This binding, by the way, is also silk. My guess, it's hard to say for sure since it's such a small amount, but my guess is that this is a silk taffeta because it's much stiffer than this silk right here. I think the only other things that I have to point out on the inside of this bodice are that the collar is very, very loosely tacked on. You can see these really big running stitches on this portion of the collar. I think that that kind of tacking is why we find so many bodices nowadays that no longer have their collars attached because they were made to be so easily removable. The other thing that I really like is that our center front closure is extremely curvy. Now we have already discussed that this was probably a smaller busted woman because this really did not fit my dress form at the bust. However, it's still super, super curvy down to her waist, which of course the waist didn't fit my dress form either. It wasn't until the high hip down here that it actually fit my dress form. Now, as far as that center front panel goes, this is lined with a third type of fabric. I think this may actually be a tarlatan or possibly maybe an organdy if organdy came in brown or they dyed it because it has a weave very similar to what I'm used to in organdy, kind of where it's very, very obvious and it's a much stiffer fabric. You can see like the fold of it right here. It really holds its own body with this cut velvet here on the outside. Now this has all just been folded to the inside and stitched down with whip stitches, even up here at the corner. I think they did a nice job with that. There is this weird part right here where I think they at first must have wanted this to go down a little lower and then realized, oh no, actually it comes together fine. We don't need that. Let's just cut that strangely and tuck that all up because this has been finished here on the inside with its own hem and then it's just been pulled up and whip stitched with a few whips up right there to get it out of the way. Before this whole piece was applied, this was turned over and stitched down by hand as well. They did a really, really nice job stitching this down. You can barely see the stitches at all right there on the edge. Let's go ahead and attempt to take some measurements of this little lady. So I wasn't really able to do this on camera since I need both hands, but the bust measurement when this is pulled taut, I have this hooked at the center right now, it is 33 inches total. And the waist measurement down here is 22 and three quarter inches. So actually we do have a 10 inch difference between the waist and the bust. Thank you all so, so much for joining me today to look at this incredibly beautiful bodice. I definitely think that there are some details that I am going to borrow from this bodice to use on future projects of mine, especially the gorgeous pleating on this belt. I think that is just so, so flattering the way that it has those really nice pleats coming together at the little point in the front and then ending in that gorgeous rosette in the back. I think that is just so pretty. I also really love the triangular detail. I think that is such a cool detail. So I definitely think that in future 1890s projects, I will be borrowing maybe both elements of this bodice. If you did enjoy looking at this antique bodice, I actually have a huge playlist containing tons of videos looking at various antiques in my collection. I've been doing this series now basically since the start of my YouTube channel, so like nearly three years and pretty much once a month for most of that time. So yeah, I will put that playlist down in the description below. You can check that out. There's a lot more of these videos for you to watch. If you liked this video though, please go ahead and click the thumbs up icon. And if you'd like to see more videos like this from me, please go ahead and click subscribe and the little bell icon to be notified every time I post a new video. I do post videos here on YouTube twice a week with my sewing vlogs out on Tuesdays and other random costuming content like this out on Saturdays, but I post every day over on my Instagram. So please go follow me on Instagram. That's at Lady Rebecca Fashions. And if you'd like to help support my channel, I do have a link to my Patreon and my Ko-fi down in the description below or you can send me a super thanks right here on YouTube. I'd also like to give a special shout out to my Edwardian level patrons, Sharon and Mirage. Thank you all so, so much for joining me today. I hope you all have a wonderful week and I will see you very soon in my next video. Happy sewing!